Hello everyone, my name is Linnea Wallen. I am a lecturer and PhD candidate in public sociology at Queen Margaret University here in Edinburgh, or in Musselburgh more specifically. And I was meant to be here with my co-presenter Rich Hayden, who is the assistant director that's thank you. The assistant director at the Scottish Cranach Centre. Unfortunately, he is snowed in, so he's stuck in Aberfeldy. So last night at 10 p.m., he recorded his bits for the presentation. So you'll see a little video of him up in the corner uh, on some of the slides. And uh, he also did. Um, he uh, he gave about a three and a half minute long explanation as to saying that he was really sorry he couldn't be here, that I cut out just because otherwise we'd really really run out. But he is really sorry he can't be here. Um, so. In this presentation, we are going to be discussing how research, and specifically research that comes out of my PhD and museum practice at the Scottish Cranach Centre, how that, how that underpins some of the activist and what may be considered as revolutionary uh, work within that museum. And specifically, we are going to be talking about this in relation to the notion of uncertainty. So. Over to Rich from last night. So just very quickly, uh, Scottish Cranach Centre is a small museum located on Mount Titan. Um, we have a mission, and our mission is to be careful and make accessible the finds of Scottish Cranachs for the benefit, education, joint work. We are the centre which is built around collections in Oakland. So how does our way of work relate to social life Um Well, the organisations... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Why is that happening? So just very quickly, uh, the Scottish Cranach Centre is a small museum located on Rock Tay. Um, we have a mission, and our mission is to be careful and make accessible the finds of Scottish Cranachs for the benefit, education, joy. We are a centre which is built around a collection of Oakland Cranach, which is a Cranach uh, excavated on the north side. And when our centre was put on the Rock, we had a reconstruction uh, so in June. The 11th, 2021, that reconstruction shut down. A very tragic event. It's a joy for a friend of the amounts of the building a new museum, a new site. And the aim and the mission does not change. We're going to carry on doing work with the collection, telling our story. We have a vision. Our vision is really important and relevant today. We want to be a national treasure. Love them by my all with social justice. Can we talk a little bit like, we want to create an organization where there's a thousand fingerprints, a thousand voices involved in all that we do, and that we're rooted in the community and we're capable of going through gears, whether that's being locally uh, rooted, whether it be nationally, internationally, significant, and all that, we want to be able to, to, to move through and be able to provide. So, we are at a museum completely focused on building our visitor experience, and this is a journey and there's some. Really, that's 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 around a guided tour through the museum, reconstruction we used to have it, um, and then also some demonstration of what could be called shelters and something. But the point being, we're kind of fascinated with this. We use for a number of different things: it's technology, technology, cooking, storytelling, uh, pottery, uh, wood turning, whatever it might be, um, and that's a way of demonstrating. The skills and the crafts we do this, everything, everything is like a guide. And um, so this capacity for conversation, and um, this capacity not just for conversation in terms of logic, but also you know, discussion and raising critical questions, uh, collection story. We're telling them where they are here. So, how does our way of work relate to social life of business? Um, well, the organization's sustainable model, you can see here, it, it's not built on so long and sustainability in terms of camera and things like that. What we did is we built on sustainability from four aspects of the Corona Center's way of work, not only make it resilient and sustainable, uh, but also links firmly back to the way we live to. We're not going to talk too much about this, go for this. Time. Thing. That, but the key aspects in the centre of that, that treatment there and on the diagram is dispersal leadership, freedom of self, activism. Okay, and these things are very quite holistic, they're not specific, um, but what it does is it allows us to use an inclusive workforce, um, it allows us to be a supportive but also a solution based organisation. That freedom of self allows people to. to 
enjoy and, and, and embrace the work that they are doing as members of staff or volunteers, especially as well. Um, it is a safe space. Um, we're, we're vocal, um, but with, with the way that we approach activism, it's not um, big, big, big statements as such. Um, it's in the small, it's in the everyday, which I'll come back to later. Uh, but by the everyday, you know, little things that we do um, consistently. What this means is we're a space for anyone, but not necessarily everyone. So that might seem like a, a strange comment to say, but it is very, very relevant, is that it doesn't matter who comes through the door. It's the same welcome. It's the same, you know, conversations. It's the same start. Um, doesn't matter who you are. But that might not be for everyone. You know, there's people that come in and don't like, for instance, the way that we all year round have the, the Pride Progress flag out. Somebody comes in, that might not be for them. We don't want them there. But that, that's a space for anyone. But not for everyone um, and we're a diverse workforce okay so we promote engagement with diverse teams you cannot engage a diverse audience unless you don't have a diverse team some of the work that the chronic center does has been reconceptualized through this lens of uncertainty and to some extent this has come out out of some of my phd research findings and before I get into that, just I'm a sociologist. I'm not an archaeologist. My research doesn't focus on prehistory. It also doesn't focus on uncertainty. My research is about memory, and it's specifically about how memory can be used and understood and conceptualized in museum community engagement activities. And this notion of uncertainty in dealing with prehistory was something that came through really strongly when I was working with the Scottish Crown Center. So that's kind of the basis for, for the research. And also just to provide you with some context, so for the, some of the data that I'll be referring to and some of the examples, I interviewed, uh, I did interviews with the Cranach Centre staff and apprentices and volunteers. I also did some observations over the course of one week, looking at how the Cranach Centre team interacted with one another, so how the staff interacted, but also how they interacted with the visitors. And when we talk about memory, we have to make an attempt to try and define what it is that we are talking about. Because memory is a vast concept. It means different things to different people. It means different things across disciplines or across contexts. So in this specific case, my understanding of memory was very much steered by what the participants themselves understood memory to be. And in this instance, they predominantly saw memory as existing in the Iron Age artifacts that they have in their collections, and specifically in the kind of human traces that exist on those artifacts, so in fingerprints on pottery, for example. That's what they saw memory as being in this case. And leading on from that, when we think about working with memory, or memory work, or the practice of memory, uh, they saw that as predominantly involving keeping the memory of those people on those artifacts alive. So to make sure that they were not forgotten, and to do that by communicating those memories or by using those memories uh, in various different ways. But they also saw the work as involving creating new memories for visitors who come to the site. So more about visitor engagement, um, if you will. So in making visits memorable. So both of these understandings of working with memory um, ties in with we are, what we're about to say. And dealing with memory always involves dealing with prehistory. We can't rely on memory. Often it's not very accurate. And does it have to be? Uh, but maybe even more so when we are working with memories of a very, very distant time or very long ago. So we know relatively little about the prehistoric lives of the Iron Age uh, people in Kenmore. Um, so we need to keep this notion of uh, uncertainty in mind. And for the sake of this presentation, we will be specifically referring to this notion of critical memory work, which is the type of memory work that I have created from the data at the site. And critical memory work involves how we can actually use memory to understand the past, but also how we can use that past to understand our role in shaping uh, society uh, in the present as well as in the future. And in a very practical sense, what that means is to actively encourage visitors to question and to consider the information that they are being presented with at the deeper level. So that's where the criticality comes in. So rather than just providing them with information, we want them to think deeper about it. And that relates back to what Rich said earlier about uh, kind of tours and conversations being an integral part of a visit to the to Cranach the, uh, Centre. And what's also worth pointing out in relation to that is that everyone at the Scottish Cranach Centre acknowledged the uncertainty of much of the information that they have about the Cranach dwellers. 
uh, and that we can make some interpretations of the evidence that we have got, but there is a lot that we cannot know with 100% certainty. And everyone in the team felt that it was really important to make the uh, distinction between what is true and what is not true, and that it was very important not to intentionally share false information. And that's and it's not a very surprising finding, a very, very novel, like, oh, they don't lie. But what is interesting about that is that they all also emphasized that it's important to make interactions with visitors engaging and to make them memorable. And how you could do that is to not just, again, provide facts, because a lot of the time that isn't very engaging. But as Rich mentioned, it is about telling stories. And when telling stories, the uh, Cranach Center staff had to make consistent distinctions between what is fact and what is interpretation and what is imagination. And Rich will tell you what that looks like in practice now. So we are talking about the Iron Ages period with, as we said before, no written records. We rely solely on the physical artifacts um, for their interpretation, okay? And, and those artifacts themselves are interpreted. So when talking about these artifacts during the tour and talking about the past, this uncertainty is made incredibly clear. Okay, so as you can see, it's it's evident in in the application of of language during the tours. So just a few examples here. We are potentially looking at this. Might be we don't know for certain. The honest answer is we can't know for sure. Okay, now saying these things, it's it's not a cul-de-sac. Okay, it doesn't just go down to to a dead end. It's actually a brand new way of engaging. Okay, and it opens up many new avenues of conversation if you handle it in the right way. So what this means is you have to have a level of honesty, you have to have a level of bravery as well, okay? It doesn't mean we have uh, guides that, that, you know, because they're saying we don't know, they don't need to know. Of course they need to know what they're talking about, and they know a ton about what they're talking about. Um, but when you say you don't know, it means you can give interpretation following it, okay? So this uh, allow, but what it does is it allows the visitor to then feel comfortable to be critical of that interpretation. They're aware of it as interpretation, so they can begin to think about it in a way uh, that is more relevant to themselves. So what I mean by that is by saying, we don't know, but it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. They're immediately allowed and they feel comfortable to start thinking about what they think it might be. For instance, just today, in fact, as I'm recording this, I had a cabinet maker on a tour saying that when he saw the tool marks on one of our pieces of wood, he could see how somebody had stood over it with the wood adds and could see the level of skill in the woodwork that was being done. Now, a huge element of, of being able to get somebody to do this is, is, is to buy in. You can't have a guide or a curator bring in their ego into that space. And this is really important. It's about understanding that, that when we talk about heritage in the museum space, it's a space, space and a place for conversation, not dictation. So two-way learning is the way we talk about this. It's so different to interacting with a panel of text. And I can't stress this enough. It doesn't matter how well written your label is. A visitor cannot have a conversation with a label or develop their ideas in communication with that label. It's got to be with a person. Somebody has to be able to facilitate So the best case study we have for what I've just talked about there is that um, the question, why did people build Cranlocks? Uh, it's the most commonly asked question uh, as part of our guided tours. And if the visitors don't ask it, we ask the visitors. Um, and the answer is we don't know. Again, it's not an end to it. It's not a place to end that conversation. It's a place to start a brand new one. OK, um, it could be security. It could be status. It could be trade. It could be something that we don't know. It could be something that we can't ascertain. It could be something completely off the wall, quite frankly. However, there's a universality to, to buildings and structures that, that is within this conversation. People are people. OK, lots of people, visitors can bring lots of ideas into this space. Staff, visitors, volunteers, um, they can and should be in a place within our museum where they can express those views, where they can they can feel like they can have that conversation. They can criticise, they can say, I don't think it is that, I think it could be this. But that allows, really importantly, that allows a deeper engagement with the past. And simply put, they can place their own interpretation against the past, um, but understand that it's an interpretation. You know, it's not imagination, it's interpretation.
method for critical engagement also came through in encouraging the visitors to make links between the past, the present and the future. And for the, not just give them those explanations, but to encourage them to discover them for themselves through conversation. And another example of them doing this uh, in practice, other than the one Rich just gave, was when talking about textiles, for example. So the visitors are taken through different sites and one of those uh, stations is textiles. And the interpreter who was staffing that station didn't just provide them with information about textiles in the Iron Age, but they also raised questions about how we can understand textiles in the Iron Age in relation to sustainability and environmental problems that are related to the textile industry today. So by doing that, they created a link between the past and the present, but they also started to consider what the textile industry might look like in future, and if there is something that we can actually learn from the Iron Age. So not just staying in the present, but also taking it on into the future. So social activism, museums and uncertainty to kind of bring it in, in a way, our social activism at the Scottish Cramming Centre, it's, it's through embedded practice. It's not done through targeted projects. The second you target one group, whatever group that might be, if we're a project, you then ignore everything else around it, okay? We are here for anyone. So whoever comes through that door, this can be it is done, it's not can be, it is done through small processes and these small processes are interconnected. Being able to talk about uncertainty, having staff with the freedom of self that they feel they can talk about things, but also have a conversation with the visitor through the door. That simple warm welcome through the door. I can't stress that more than enough, a big hello and a warm welcome and a smile on the face in a nice shop where people can be arrived and feel like they're welcome. It immediately gives them a stepping off point that they can create a space which as we say is for anyone but also that then leads into them down the line when they're on the tour starting to feel more comfortable to engage okay and within that space space as i've said here there is freedom to interpret and engage in the past in meaningful ways and to wrap this all up simply put when you're talking about heritage in a museum or a visitor center or wherever you do not know who is coming through your door and if you're not willing to have a conversation with them you're denying them the chance to maximize their engagement with their heritage in a way that could be more meaningful and more profound than you yourself could ever know and this is through asking questions promoting conversation and fundamentally embracing the democratic power of uncertainty thank you